Hi Chem students, we're going to do an initial rate problem which is a type of kinetics problem where we have experimental data and try to find the experimental rate law from that. It's a common problem and one that you should probably master because you'll probably see it on an exam or two. So here's how it normally looks when you see it. It's a problem where you're given some data in a table, almost always in some kind of tabular form, a reaction, and you're asked, given that data, what is the experimental rate law? And also you're asked what the rate constant is. So this one set of data right here is more than enough to get that information from you. So it works this way. First off, when we have a reaction such as the one we see here, we can immediately write down a generic rate law for it. It's going to include the rate, and that's the rate of the reaction, equals the rate constant times each of the reactants raised to some arbitrary constant x, y, or z. And also, just so you know, if we have a catalyst involved with the reaction, we can include it as well. Catalysts can be included in the rate law. Now, these x, y's, and z's, these things are called orders with respect to whichever term they're involved with. So, for example, x is the order with respect to the H2SEO3. And what that says is, hey, the size of x tells us how important H2SEO3 is to the rate. If I have a large order, it's more important. So the y then in this particular case is the order with respect to i minus, the z the order with respect to h plus. It's kind of important that you write this down, this generic rate law, so that people know when you're doing the problem which order you're solving for as you do the problem. One last thing, the rate constant, just remember that that contains the temperature dependence and so if we change the temperature that will change. However, if we keep the temperature the same throughout the entire experiment, then the K will be a constant and it won't change. That's going to be useful because we're going to try to get rid of that K and not have to deal with it early on in the process. So here's how it all works. The goal, determine these orders of reaction via the experimental evidence. And uh, just to remind you, we don't get the orders of reaction from the stoichiometry for any bulk reactions. Uh, so just go ahead and skip that. Use, don't use the stoichiometry for a bulk reaction. Use the experiments. The way we're going to do this is we're going to find a unique, a, un a substance that is unique to any two trials of the experiment. And the idea is that if only one of the substances changes concentration, then it is responsible for all the change that might occur in the rate. All right, so here we go. We would first start by exploring the data for unique changes. And this is pretty easy to see when we look at trial one and trial two. So if you take a close look at the H2SEO3 concentration, it's changing. However, you can see that the iodide ion and the H plus ion, this hydrogen ion, neither of those changes. So the change that we see in the initial rate of the reaction must be due to the changing of the H2SO, H2SEO3 concentration. What I'm going to now walk you through is how do we take this information, this situation, and use it to our advantage. Well, first, I want you to imagine if we were talking about the first trial, we might write that the rate is equal to K times our, essentially it's our generic rate law, but we've added in the little bit of information saying, hey, this is the rate from trial one. This is the concentration from trial one and the concentration from trial one in all of these. We can also imagine that trial two would have a similar looking rate expression. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this rate, rate one, and divide it by rate two. And when I do that, I can immediately take the right hand side of each one of these equalities and make a ratio of that as well. So here we've made a ratio of rates. We've made a ratio of all the other aspects of the rate equation, the rate law. And immediately I see that the k's cancel out. I see one other aspect that I can take into account and that is both of these H2SEO3's are raised to the same power so I can group them together. The i minuses from the two different trials are raised to the same power. I can group them together and so forth with any other species that's grouped to the same power. That simplifies a little bit my expression to look like this. So I've got this ratio of rates rated uh, set up so that we've got these uh, powers, these orders sitting out there all by themselves. Well now it gets even simpler when I realize that for iodide, that little term there, if I was to plug in the actual values, I'd get 
0.82 divided by 0.82. That's just 1. And 1 raised to any power is still 1. That means this term over here is equal to 1. And similarly, the H plus terms, because they're the same concentration, are both equal to 1 as well. So if that's equal to 1, we can just ignore them. And voila, we have a relationship between our ratio of rates, our ratio of concentrations, and the power that we're raised to. So if we take a good close look at this, there's a way to rearrange it using some of our log algebra that you're supposed to know. And it goes like this. First, I take a natural log of both sides. Then I bring the x down because I can. That's part of the log algebra. And then I rearrange and solve for my x. Now, all of that algebra, every bit of the algebra, is not something I'm going to ask you to repeat on the test. This isn't an algebra class. However, you need to know then this equation which really says that the order for any particular species, in this case HTSO3, and it's got the order x, it's equal to the natural log of the ratio of rates divided by the natural log of the ratio of the concentrations. We can do that for any particular set here. So for example, if we look at trials 4 and 5, we have a, the natural log of rate of 4 and 5, okay, would be related to I minus. We're going to use that later, and I minus is y, so we would say that y is equal to the natural log of rate 4 divided by rate 5, the concentration of h of i minus trial 4 and i minus trial 5. And we just do the math then, find out what x is. Let's go ahead and do that for all three of our species in this reaction. Voila, here we are back looking at the same table. We're going to focus on x, that's why it's in red. We solve for x by plugging in the values from our table. They come from the table, nowhere else. We end up getting a 1 here. And just as a note, these orders have to be either integers or half integers, and they can be positive or negative. All right, so integers being 1, 2, 3, 4, or 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And half integers being things like 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves. Those are all acceptable. You will never get anything, though, that is a 1 third or a 2 thirds. Uh, a, a three quarters won't be possible either. If you get that, you have made an error and you need to go back and make sure that only one species is changing concentration. All right, so now that we've done the uh, order, we found out what x is, we can just plug it right back in. And if you notice, when I raise something to the first power, I don't really write the one. Any other power, I write down what it is, but I don't normally write that everything's raised to the first power. All right, let's go ahead and try something else. Um, I'm going to look at Z right now because I've noticed that trial 1 and trial 3 share common um, H2SEO3 and I- minus concentrations. However, the H plus concentration and the initial rate then has changed. Therefore, I know that Z is related to H plus, so I can solve for my Z. When I solve for my Z, I plug once again the values in from the table into all my positions. I just do the math and I get 2. Notice once here, once you look at this, that there are two different natural logs to do. You cannot group this into one big natural log. You have to do the numerator, find that number, the denominator, find that number, and then divide those two to get a 2. Make sure you can repeat this calculation. All right, well now that we've got that, that means our rate law is now a little more complete. We've got a first order and a second order component. The only thing left to find is y, and earlier I mentioned that we can find that by looking at trials 4 and trials 5. Um, once again, the i minus changes here while the other concentrations all stay the same. The rate does change, therefore changing i minus changes the rate. It's going to have some kind of order. I plug it in and I end up with a 1.5. 1.5 order is really the same thing as saying 3 halves, and it's fine to have a 1.5, a half order. This is acceptable. So voila, we would write our rate law as rate is equal to K times the HT, H2SEO3 concentration to the first power, I minus concentration to the 3 halves power, and the H plus concentration squared. All right, the only thing left to do would be to find our rate constant. Now I'm going to warn you right now that one of the biggest issues with finding the rate constant is that they have units. And the units for a rate constant change for every problem. In essence, they're decided by what the order is for all of your species. And we'll see it kind of pop out. I'm going to tell you right now that this part of a problem might be four, five, or six points. 
However, getting the units right is going to be two points. Normally units are just one on a test for my uh, classes, but this is such an important skill to find these units that I want it to be worth more and you to take it very seriously. So to find the K, all we do is we rearrange our, our uh, rate equation, our rate law, I'm sorry, uh, to be rate is equal to HT, H2, SEO3. Uh, all, the, all the concentrations are now in the denominator. I've just divided both sides by this big mess. In doing that, I can now plug in my values. And if you take a good close look here, I've, constant, I've, co I've crossed out the molarity here. I've done the math with the numbers to get 8.65, but uh, I end up with this divided by seconds. That means seconds to the minus one. Divided by means per seconds. So does the minus one here. It means reciprocal seconds. All rate constants have that one aspect in common. They're always a seconds to the minus one. Now comes the question of what, how did I get this molarity to the minus seven halves? Well, it's very simple. Here I have, after crossing out these two molarities, I have a molarity to the three halves and a molarity squared. Molarity squared is the same thing as having a molarity to the four halves. Four halves plus three halves is seven halves. It's in the denominator, so it's minus seven halves. That's how I do it. That's how you should do it too. Uh, when you have a set of data like this on an exam, I'd expect you to plug and chug just any particular trial in. I chose trial five. However, however, if you're doing this for real in an experiment, the best thing to do would be to find the K for every one of your experimental trials. And if you do that, you can find the average of these five values is 8.64, and that's a better result. So if you have time, go ahead and find those and get an average, but on an exam, because you're just trying to show me that you know how to do it, choose any one of the trials, get the answer, and you'll be in good shape. There you have it. Finding the rate constant and the rate law from the method of initial rates is just a, uh, a bunch of algebra, and I think you can do it. Uh, I want you to be able to do it, and I'm guaranteeing you're going to see it on an exam, so you might as well learn how to, how to get these 10 to 15 points that these problems are worth. There you have it. Bye.